All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Access to uh, Justice. I'm not Ola, as you can tell. I'm Wilfried Kainz. I work with the, the Zero Project. Ola, unfortunately, couldn't, couldn't manage to come and, and to chair the sessions. Um, I would like to welcome you and introduce you also to, the, to our timekeeper. Uh, we have had very strict uh, guidelines for the, for the presentations in order to give everybody a fair chance. So if there is some sirens or some warning lights, don't be afraid. It's just the timekeeper uh, cutting off the, the different speakers. I would like to welcome you on the, on the podium to my left, uh, Diana. Welcome. Uh, Yifat and uh, from the JDC and uh, the family court of Asturias to my to my far right. So in order not to lose any time and not to keep you from the sandwiches waiting outside, uh, I would like to start and I hand over to you, Diana, please. Thank you, Wilfred. Let me see if I can get the. Oops. You see it over there. Ah, <laughs> Lux, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Wilfred. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very honored to have been invited to be on this panel with such esteemed colleagues. Um, I myself am not a lawyer or a legal expert, um, so I'm happy that I'm seated on the panel with some who are. Um, I will be speaking about access to justice from a funder's perspective, um, because I'm the founding executive director of the Disability Rights Fund and its sister organization, the Disability Rights Advocacy Fund. Um, I want to give you first a big picture view of what uh, DRF and DRAF are and then proceed to speak ab about our funding in the area of access to justice. DRF and DRAF are global grant makers which pool funds from a diversity of donors, governments, public and private foundations, individuals, and we work with a participatory grant-making model. That means that we include the beneficiary community, people with disabilities, at all levels of what we do, in our governance, in our advisory, and at staff levels. Together with activists from the disability community who come from the regions and countries where we work, we make grants, we provide technical assistance, and we support advocacy at national, regional, and global levels by disabled persons organizations in Africa, Asia, Pacific, and the Caribbean. Since the launch of the fund in 2008, we have made over 1,000 grants, ranging from five to $50,000 a year, and have given out more than 25 million US dollars to 310 different organizations of people with disabilities, DPOs, across 34 countries. Because a change in how disability is viewed in the community requires a paradigm shift away from the medical model that makes persons with disabilities into objects for intervention, to a social model that sees persons with disabilities as subjects and citizens who have the capacity to be actively involved in all aspects of society, including at decision-making tables, all of our grants are for persons with disabilities themselves to do rights advocacy and advocacy for inclusion and development at national levels. We work across the disability spectrum but especially because we want to broaden and diversify the disability movement in the places where we work, more than 50% of our grants are given to marginalized sectors within the disability community. That is, to organizations of women with disabilities, youth with disabilities, rural organizations of persons with disabilities, persons with psychosocial disabilities, albinos, little people, etc. We believe that including all voices makes the disability movement stronger. In the 10 years since launch, we've tracked all our grants by their relationship to CRPD articles, and more recently, by C SDG goals. We've found that four rights and goals cons are consistently emphasized in the regions where we work. Inclusive education, social protection, accessibility, and access to justice. Access to justice has received 7% of our total funding. Um, so, others? <laughs> Thanks. Um, before talking about concrete examples from our funding, 
in Access to Justice, this slide sets the scene for the context in the CRPD and the SDGs. In a recent report by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to the Human Rights Council, it's actually a draft report still, on CRPD Article 13, it's written that access to justice is an essential prerequisite for the protection and promotion of all rights and that it encompasses the right to a fair trial, including equal access to and equality before the courts, and seeking and obtaining just and timely remedies for rights violations. And of course, access to justice is also uh, present in, the, in Goal 16 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, in order to improve access to justice for persons with disabilities, the topic of this panel, there are many barriers to address. Um, on this slide, I've listed those that are grantees, which are organizations of persons with disabilities in Africa, Asia, Pacific, and Caribbean, have uplifted as the most critical. Presumption of incapacity to stand as a witness in trial, information, communication, and physical barriers, lack of attribution of rights to persons with disabilities, not only by the justice system, but by the community, and lack of access to legal aid. This, um, in the next three slides, I'm just gonna give a very brief run through of how our grantees have addressed these barriers with examples from Rwanda, Bangladesh, and Malawi. This is a picture of Mukandoli Serafine in Rwanda and two of her children standing on land that she inherited after her father's death, but she was un unable to have because even though Rwanda implemented legal reforms in 1999 that gave women equal access um, to, to own and use land, equal rights to own and use land, um, because of the discrimination about disability, she fell through the cracks and subsequently had to live with one of her brothers and care for his children in order to survive. Um, at a DRF grantee training, she learned about the right, the right she had to access justice and was able to access legal aid through Human Rights First Rwanda Association and take her case to court, which she won, and she now has secured the land title. Today, she's advocating for other women with disabilities like her, and her land ownership has given her status to speak at community meetings, which is very important. This is Lamia, not her real name, a 14-year-old rape survivor with intellectual disabilities in Kolna, Bangladesh. A small DRF grantee organization called the Women with Disabilities Development Foundation learned about her rape through community work that they do with women with disabilities throughout Bangladesh. And they were able to connect her family to the Bangladesh Legal Aid Service Trust mm -hmm. to bring her case to court. The case is pending, but meanwhile, her rapist, who is a 60-year-old man, is in jail without bail. In Bangladesh, we have funded partnerships between DPOs, like the Women with Disabilities Development Foundation, National Council of Disabled Women, National Grassroots D Disability Organization, and the Bangladesh Legal Aid Service Trust to take cases to court and challenge the pervasive view of the justice system that women with disabilities are not viable witnesses, and to research and report on gaps in access to justice. They, uh, they have been able together with the DPO community to create a report called The Current Status of Rights of Persons with Disabilities in Bangladesh, Legal and Grassroots Perspectives, that will be used to report to the CRPD committee and also for local advocacy. Finally, this is a, a picture of the Disabled Women uh, Association of Malawi, Director Rachel Kachaja, who's signing a memorandum of understanding with the Lilongwe Police Department to promote greater response to cases of, of um, violence against women with disabilities. With DRF funding, DIWA was able to conduct a baseline survey amongst women with disabilities about violence and to use this baseline to advocate for greater police attention. And, that, and they've also been able to pilot disability deaths in police stations and an access audit of the justice system which has just been presented to the Chief Justice. More and more women with disabilities are now accessing justice through these mechanisms. In conclusion, what we have found works is, one, 
partnerships between DPOs and justice providers so both, both can learn, training of members of the judiciary on the rights of persons with disabilities and reasonable accommodations, and three, documenting human rights violations against persons with disabilities in order to do advocacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for giving us insight about uh, the DRF and uh, what the money is spent on. Um, I'd like to introduce you to JDC. Um, it's an innovative practice, so we will get an award later today. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of doing some of the research for the, uh, for the practice and what they've been doing. Uh, but we have two very competent persons on my right-hand side who will give you insight uh, what's happening in the work of the GDC. So you have not drawn it, up to you. And I am from JDC and one is from... Sorry. I'm the child, uh, the ch the, I'm the director of the Child and Special Investigation Service in the Ministry of uh, Labor and Social Affairs in Israel. So, only the... Thank you. So this is G. He's a 17-year-old boy that learns in special education school. And when his teacher noticed a change in his behavior, she asked him what happened. He told her that another student on the school bus touched his genitals and not for the first time. G is a nonverbal speaking. He uses a communication board with symbols and drawings that represents action, people, places, and experience from his day-to-day -day life. This is his only means of communication. To the question what happened on the school bus, there were no answers on G's communication board. Fragmented explanations through body language made it clear to the teacher that something happened that must be reported. She reported to the youth law social worker who reported to the police who referred to a special investigator. Special investigator is a social worker who was qualified as a child investigator and after special training is also qualified to conduct special investigations of people with disabilities. The investigator turned to a speech-language pathologist, which from now on we will call SLP, who works with the ministry and is an expert in augmentative and alternative communication, which from now on we will call AAC. And uh, the SLP has an AAC kit that was specially developed for our program, uh, designed for investigation and testimony in abuse and assault cases. At the end of the investigation, G was asked how he felt regarding the process, and this thumbs up was his answer. This is a unique partnership between the government and the relevant professionals and non-profit organizations. Led by the Ministry of Labor and Social Services, JDC Israel Shalim, and the Haruv Institute, together with many others, as you can see. In the past four years, we piloted the program, keeping in mind that in the future, once we initiate the pilot program, the, it will be managed by the Ministry of Labor, Social Services, and Welfare. The Law for Investigation and Testimony Adjustment for, uh, for People with Disabilities 2005 requires that the, that the investigation of persons with cognitive disability, included people with autism, will be conducted by special investigators. The law also says that the investigation can be conducted using uh, AAC. The investigation is filmed and the video can sometimes serve as a substitute for testimony. The special investigator provides the recommendation for appropriate condition and accommodations. Until this law, all G's social worker could have done was to turn to the family, develop a protection plan together with the school, refer to treatment, and follow up on it. She did not have the option to turn to a cognitive to a special investigator who would know how to investigate person with cognitive disabilities through his language. Uh, when someone with disability submits a complaint to the police, it is referred to a special investigator. 
The special investigator collects background information about the person and the suspected crime. When necessary, calls SLP who gather additional information on communication ability and needs of the individual. They plan and conduct the investigation together. This is unique from all our other investigations. Since every, every communication board is different and the investigation person usually doesn't have the vocabulary on his board, a tailor-made board is created for each person based on their existing board. We have now trained eight special investigators who can investigate AAC users, and we call them very special investigators. We also have 14 SLPs who graduate our course. The pilot lasted four years, in which we develop an organizational and professional platform by writing protocol, conducting training for special investigators and SLP, and developing AAC kits for investigation and buying relevant technological equipment, computer, iPad. Uh, we needed to develop an investigation style that accommodate, accommodates uh, communication tools and can be admissible in court while minimizing suggestibility. We also needed to raise awareness among uh, professionals in order to ensure that they recommend the service to a potential uh, users. Of, all of this was accompanied, accompanied by two studies. Uh, when we started the pilot in 2011, we only had three AAC users referred to investigation. The number of the referrals in the fifth year was 600% uh, uh, bigger, and we believe that the number will grow even more. We want to reach every AAC a user who needs to be investigated as victim, witness, or suspect. So this research looked at the methods through which the special investigator conducted the investigation with the support of the SLP, as well as the information collected and the results attained. In the majority of the investigations, significant relevant information was discovered. Yet these investigations uh, attained less details compared to those involving people with other disabilities. This additional, additional research looked at the impact of the pilot program beyond the investigation room and found that the program had 14 impacts on additional methods of investigation, on the professionals and organizations involved, and on society. Among them are these six impacts. Promoting the value of justice, increasing access to justice, revealing the truth, stopping the abuse and offering therapy, increasing personal safety and confidence of people with disabilities and their families, developing new professionals, and raising awareness for healthy sexual behavior within the special education system. Over the past four years, cost of developing the service totaled at about $350,000 and included developing training programs, raising awareness, developing and purchasing AAC kits and cameras, and working with other community services. We presented at, at 120 lectures, trainings, and conferences, reaching over 5,000 people. The ongoing service demands more working hours on behalf of the special investigators and SLPs, as well as maintenance of the second camera. This will total at about $28,000 a year, so it can be done. <coughs> Our ministry appointed a national coordinator and point person in each district and regula regulated the employment of the SLPs. The next challenge is to make sure that the investigation person will be able to give testimony and determine the legal precedent in, and, as a legal president in court. 
Israel recently decided <coughs> to fund com communication aids, so, be so we believe that even more people with uh, complex communication needs who are at risk will make use of this service. Thank you. Thank you so much for shedding the light in a very unique cooperation, I think, from the, from the state and the, and, the, and the private service provider uh, in uh, getting better access to justice. Uh, the third uh, party on the, on the panel here is the Family Court of Asturias. This is a Spanish province in the north of Spain and a company called Plena Inclusión. And Juan Carlos, please tell you what you have been doing. No, it's Casilda. Yes. Good morning. My name is Casilda Sabine, and I want to thank the organizer of this international conference and all the attendees. It's a great opportunity for us to present the project of adaptation of sentences to easy language that I'd like to introduce you with the following video. Court verdicts in easy language Many people with intellectual disabilities or understanding difficulties receive court verdicts of modification of their legal capacity, but they do not understand the document. And that's why we had an idea. We reached an agreement with the family courts. And now, the original verdict is sent together with another document in easy language. This document is the court verdict adapted into easy language. This project has been pioneering and has been very successful. Because it's the first time in Spain and in Europe that together with the original court verdict of modification of the legal capacity, a document with the court verdict in easy language is sent to the person. Thanks to this document, the person who receives the court verdict understands what will happen to his life from that moment forward. Plena Inclusion is a national organization born 53 years ago for the defense of all rights of people with intellectual disabilities. There is a Plena Inclusion organization in each of the regions of Spain, and we are in Asturias. We all work in a network thanks to the same objective, and we try to generate positive change in society that allow the full inclusion of the collective. A project of adaptation of sentences in easy reading is born of a commitment to make the world a more understandable place, not only by right, but to create a good for all citizens, and especially people with intellectual disabilities, elderly people, migrants, and other groups with understanding difficulties. Most people have many problems to understand legal documents because of their complexity and it's more difficult for people with understanding difficulties. Especially in the sector in which we work, people have had or will have a moment in their lives in which the relief or the corresponding court for a possible modification of their legal... Sorry. capacity for economic health, etc. For people who do not have intellectual disabilities but have difficulties in understanding sentences, adapt to easy reading can be very useful. For people, for example, for people from other countries who live in Spain or for the elderly who have understanding difficulties because they have a disease, for example, Alzheimer's. We start our project at the end of 2016 thanks to the support of the Superior Court of Justice of Asturias, and in particular for President Mr. Ignacio Vidal 
and also Juan Carlos here at the table. The project comes through with the participation of the Family Course of Oviedo, capital de Asturias. What is the technical part of the project? Briefly, I point out the technical procedure that we carry out in plena inclusion. It's a reading, it's a way of writing, adapting, and validating texts to make them easier to understand, being one of the most valuable resources in Spain of the organization in plena inclusion. The steps in the adaptation are generally common and applicable to all types of documents with adaptation guidelines of inclusion Europe. First, adaptation by professionally following certain standards of style, and then the validation of the text by a group of people with intellectual disabilities who has been trained on this matter. This is an example of the type of sentences we receive from the court, and this one is an example of the easy language version we send back. You can perceive the difference between both documents. It is essential to highlight to active, the active participation of people with intellectual disabilities. They will be the ones who will say whether a document is understand or not. This project has been a pioneer. It is the first time in Spain and in Europe that, together with the original core verdict of the modification of legal capacity, a document is delivered with the verdict in easy language. <coughs> it is also the first to have the participation of all parties involved in the process of chaining the legal capacity of specific persons. The person whose capacity will be modified. They are families, lawyers, and magistrates. And it has had a very positive re reception for all of them. In addition, carry out this project is Asturias has been a first step for other provinces in Spain begin to the same and other courts begin to adapt the sentences to easy language. This project has had an important impact in the national level. As I mentioned before, it has been a first step for provinces to begin to do the same and for other courts to begin to adapt sentences to easy reading. And we hope that soon adaptation of all kinds of legal documents will be made in which a person with intellectual disabilities is affected. Certainly, the main success is to offer accessible information to people with understanding difficulties and who are going to enter a process that will affect their lives. Ensure, in this way, access to information so that all citizens, regardless of their abilities, know that they will be watched over in, the, in a dignified and respectful manner. Give the opportunity for people with limited intellectual capacity to take an active part in their lives. We emphasize respect for the rights of each person individually the ethical value of the entire judici judicial process. We live in times in which nothing has to be done for them but with them. Family use very over time the benefits that this project brings to the families of the affected person of, by sharing of the judicial process, <coughs> understanding it well. The government of Asturias has assumed the contract with our organization to finance the project and thus maintain it in time with greater intensity. Our challenge is to work this year and the next with the family course of Asturias, including other vulnerable groups, migrants, foreigners. Finally, I say goodbye in my name of my colleagues present here 
of the entire organization and especially in my own name begin for the oh the wordness of my expression. We will be will be at your disposal every day if you need us from the green corner of our land Asturias. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for shedding some light to the work of, of Plena Inclusion. And now, Juan Carlos, it's over to you from the Family Court of Asturias in, in Spain. Please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I, I have to say it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to participate in this amazing conference. Well, perhaps it's, uh, it's uh, sandwich time but uh, we, we, can, we can wait uh, a, couple, a couple of minutes for it. Uh, Plena Inclusión Asturias and the judiciary in Asturias uh, have been working together on this project since the beginning, and that's the reason why both of us are presenting the same project, as you can, as you can see in the, in the slide. I am a jazz in Spain, I work in a court, and I have been at Jazz for the last 24 years. Uh, Casilda, the representative of Plena Inclusión Asturias, has just explained this project. And of course, I'm not going to repeat the same explanation. I'm only going to talk about uh, my experience, my impression as a member of the court. Well, I have to say, perhaps the most important thing that, that I have to say is that I do love this project. I believe in this project because this project is good and positive for people with intellectual disabilities because this system will help them to understand the adjustment. But it is also good and positive for the families, because this system will help them to understand what the court has decided. It's also good and positive for the court, for the judiciary, because we need to be sure that the citizen has understood the judgment. And finally, it's also good and positive for other persons with disabilities because it will be an opportunity to access to the employment as a member of the validation team. So we are making the most of this, of this project. During these minutes, perhaps I, 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 don't, I don't have nine minutes now, uh, I'm going to talk about these four main points. We can, we can go directly, directly for the first one. Yes. Well, access to the justice system is not only about uh, a legal or a physical access. It's not enough to break down the legal or physical barriers. We need to improve communication and be sure that the citizen understood what the court decided about him or her. The legal language is difficult to understand for everyone, even for the justice. Okay. Sometimes I don't understand the judgment of another judge. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, it's difficult for everyone, but particularly for people with intellectual uh, disabilities. Uh, we are trying to ensure the law becomes a reality because, well, we, can, we may have uh, hundreds of laws, thousands of laws, many laws, but the most important thing is that uh, the law has a present in the real life of the people. The law become a reality. Next slide. Okay. Oh, sorry. <coughs> well, we are talking about uh, easy language and we have to make it easy. So the easiest way is these three 
questions and answers. What do we want to do? Well, to make Kurt Bertitz and Samancy easy to understand. And why? Because these documents has, are difficult to understand, especially for people with cognitive disability. And how? Well, the court has to convert the documents into easy language. But we aren't um, experts in this field. So we need a company, an organization, a wonderful team of experts that uh, uh, do that, that work. And um, what about the procedure? Well, uh, you can see in this, in this slide, uh, when the judgment is, is written, the court uh, sends their official documentation to Plena Inclusión, Plena Inclusión Asturias, an NGO that supports people with intellectual disabilities, and this organization, this organization converts the document into, into easy language. Uh, the easy language document has to be validated by an expert team, which includes persons with disabilities. The final document is sent to the court, and the court uh, has to check it and if everything is okay, uh, finally this uh, document is sent to the recipient, to the person. Well, in these steps, perhaps, the, well, all of them are important, of course, but perhaps the most important is when the document is converted into easy language, because individuals with disabilities participate in the team of experts that converts the document into easy language, giving them a chance for employment. Next one. Okay. Well, two key aspects of this project. Of course, if you, if you want to do the same in, in your country, I, I, I hope you, you will you will want it. Uh, you will need a company or an organization which converts the document into easy language. Of course, basically. But I think it's important to, to, to have a member of the judiciary system, uh, a member of the court, because um, this person can act as coordinator um, perhaps uh, he will be able to explain this project to other judges, to the court, and promote this, this project. And finally, the, the, the current situation. Um, Casilda has just uh, spoken about our successful piloting in Oviedo and other uh, regions of Spain are reproducing this project and the Spanish General Council for the Judiciary are planning to extend this project to all, to all Spain. And what about the future? Well, uh, perhaps in the future, uh, we will be able to extend this project to other areas, for example, elderly people, uh, children in the civil proceedings of divorce or a legal separation, or um, perhaps uh, people from other countries. Uh, who knows? The future will give us the answer. Um, well, that's all. Thanks a lot for your attention, and thanks for the Zero Project Conference for this invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Thank you also the, the panel, everybody on this panel here for your discipline. It's impressive. So we have plenty of, of time for, for questions. Uh, I, I would like to start off. Uh, Diana, you told us uh, roughly 7% of your budget 
goes into the support. How, how do you select your, your projects? How, how does this work? So, um, in the countries where we're doing funding, we have an open call for proposals once a year. And uh, that open call sometimes is preceded by a letter of interest, so not very long documents have to be um, produced by an organization of persons with disabilities. Um, we select um, the, some of the projects um, among staff. Um, many of my staff are come from the disability movement themselves and are in uh, Africa, Indonesia, Haiti. So they're uh, very much part of the context and they're aware of the organizations and the networks. Um, so are able to identify organizations that are viable and not just suitcase organizations, as they say. Um, then uh, my staff write grant recommendations, which go to our grant making committee, which is uh, half uh, leaders with disabilities and half donor representatives. Um, and we have that structure so that leaders with disabilities um, will be able to inform donors um, and donors will be able to inform leaders with disabilities, each from their own expert position. Um, and they uh, review all the grant recommendations, make decisions um, on which grants will be funded, um, and that is a once a year process. Most of our grants, 70% of them are repeat grants, so in places where we've been 10 years now, um, we've had grantees over a 10-year period. Because we're funding rights advocacy, um, policy change, legal change, um, change of government services, it takes a long time. And we recognize that. We support organizations over a longer period of time. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Yifat, I would like to ask you, I mean, you have a, a cooperation between the ministry and, uh, and your organization. Uh, what role does the police play, or how, how they direct to, to this new method? So the police was a partner in this program. Okay. They were part of us. Of course, they support that. In Israel, uh, ch child, invest child investigations are conducted by, by uh, social workers. It's the department that Ronit is in charge on. And in the police, we have two kinds of investigators, uh, youth investigators and adults investigators. The problem that the police had that all of us had in the program, and we tried to partly answer it in the, in the program, was that when someone comes to the police, they don't always know that they have disability, mainly in cognitive disabilities and in ASD. Uh, and that is one of the things that we tried to do in the program, uh, to, uh, to train them. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Please, questions from the audience. Please raise your hand. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andreas Reinalter. I'm from the Minister of Social Affairs here in Austria. Uh, I have a question to Juan Carlos uh, Lopez. Um, you mentioned that uh, after the process you got the feedback from, from the experts. Um, um, what, what uh, you mentioned, there are, if there are no problems, uh, you finalize it. Uh, uh, what is, if, you, if there are problems, uh, how do, do you deal with that? You also said uh, you have a disability expert in the judge, uh, in the court, so uh, could you explain this a little bit uh, more concrete? Thank you. Thank you for, for your question. Uh, well, until now, we, we didn't have any problem with the, with the document, with the process. Uh, as I have explained uh, before, uh, the document uh, is sent to Plena Inclusion. Plena Inclusion uh, sent the easy, easy language version of the document to the court. And in the court, we have to check that uh, this easy version uh, says uh, similar as the original version. But, uh, well, if the court uh, detected uh, any problem, of course, we will return the document to, to plain inclusion to, to adapt it, it, it again. But 
until now we, we didn't have any problem. Well, you, you, can, you can see that it's, it's a very simple document and well, we, we, we have here uh, expert of this, of this thing, we, 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 didn't, we didn't have any problem until now. Thank you. More questions, please? Yes, Michael. So, uh, Mikael Snaprud, uh, Think to Norway. Uh, I'm curious about the uh, approach in Spain, if you are looking into automated conversion from the court language to easy language uh, by compiling the examples and then feeding into machine learning. Well, in, in Spain, uh, we, we have been the first in Spain to, to do this, this experience and uh, <laughs> perhaps the future will, will, will show us uh, another, another way to, to do it. But uh, currently, it's Plena Inclusión who, who um, deal with this, with this uh, matter, and uh, the team of Plena Inclusión uh, adapts this, this document to, to easy language. Perhaps the future we will do it in another way. I, I don't know. I don't know. We, we, don't, we don't have an automatic system to, to adapt it. Yes. Thank you. One more question, please. Then I'll do the last one. Casilda, uh, it seems that plain inclusion is like a, a box of miracles. So uh, do you have lawyers uh, amongst your staff or how, how big is your organization and, and, and what's the, the, the qualifications? Plena Inclusion has uh, one or three collaborators, but um, no, no personal uh, contratado. Sorry, sorry. They, they don't have uh, their own lawyers, but uh, of course they, they, they can uh, hire the legal, services legal advice. of, of yes. the lawyers. Okay, thank you very much. A round of applause for the panel, please.